this was something I found out about like eight or nine years ago, just on a fluke, and uh, I'm gonna let Randy tell you the story. And uh, but it's an amazing story that very few people know about, but somebody that I think really should be remembered in history, but he's not. And there are reasons for that, uh, and a lot of it is political. But uh, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Randy Bishop now, and Randy, it is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be here tonight, and if y'all can't hear me, let me know. Typically, I speak to 20 to 30 high school students several times a day. That is my primary job. If I say, let me know if I get to where I'm mumbling, if I start going too fast, let me know, because again, uh, I don't want to lose any of you tonight, but the topic of my presentation tonight is going to be a man whose place in our nation's history, in my opinion, and I certainly think that Mr. John as well, has been neglected, ignored, if not somehow completely overlooked. He served the United States in a time of war, which is a characteristic that I dare say is shared with many of you in attendance tonight. He took pride in the stars and the stripes. Uh, Bates is going to be the, it should say, Bates PowerPoint. Uh, I'll give me just a second here. I'm not seeing the Gilbert No, sir. Uh, it should say. Click on Randy's folder, if you will. So maybe I'll put it in there. Bates PowerPoint. Yes, sir. There it is. Right there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, we should have to now, too. All right. But, uh, Anyhow, and today you think about the mixed reception that people have over our nation's flag. Some people love it, we have others who hate it, and I think you're gonna see that in that particular time frame as well. Another aspect of the man we're gonna be talking about tonight is that he held really strong feelings toward our country that it could be united. And do we not see that going on today, the division in our country, thank you so much, and how we need to have a semblance of unity certainly uh, inspire and both within our, our people. And that man, the individual who I plan to discuss tonight is a man by the name of Gilbert Henderson Bates. But in order to begin, I also want to share with you my introduction to Gilbert Henderson Bates. And it involves a man that I think is a friend to most, if not all of you in this room. Go back to the Middle Tennessee Civil War Show, which is in Franklin, Tennessee, December of 2019. Mr. John Thompson sitting over here to the side, and he and I have visited many times at relic shows uh, across the Southeast of the United States. He, he said, I've got somebody I think you might be interested in researching and be a good topic for a book. And he mentioned Gilbert Henderson Bates. And I told him, I said, I've never heard of him. And he told me basically what he had done, and it really intrigued me. And I started digging as the spring went on doing a little research on Gilbert Henderson Bates, and then we get to March of 2020, when the world, as we knew it at that time, fell apart, and Sharon and I both being public school teachers, we had what we call the long summer of 2020 because of COVID, and I wrote the book during the summer of 2020, sent it to Stackpole Books as a submission for publication, and it's the fastest state that I have ever had a publisher agree to publish a book, and uh, it was then printed by that Christmas, and the rest, as we say, is history. But let's look at a little bit about Mr. Bates and his place in American history. His early life is somewhat sketchy. We don't know much about him. He was born in Sweetwater, New York in 1836. So by the time of the American Civil War, you can tell he's going to be uh, in the prime of his life. In the ensuing years, he moved to the town of Albion, Wisconsin. Some people pronounce it Albion, but I understand up there it's Albion, A-L-B-I-O-N, which was known for its growth of tobacco. And there is some indications that he may have worked at a tobacco warehouse in his younger days, but again, not a lot of documentation on that. But at the onset of the American Civil War, Bates and his family joined uh, various branches of the federal military, and he himself enlisted in the 1st Wisconsin Heavy Artillery in September of 1864. So you can see he actually begins his military service in the latter stages of the war, uh, some seven months before Lee surrendered to Grant. But as a member of uh, Battery H, or Company H, of the 1st Wisconsin, he quickly rose to the rank of sergeant. He and his unit spent most of their time of existence guarding the areas, uh, some of the entrances to and exits from Washington, D.C. 
You're going to see Washington, D.C. play another important part in the life of Gilbert Henderson Banks before we wrap up tonight. But in June of 1865, Sergeant Bates, as he will be known affectionately and uh, somewhat, uh, I guess you say in sarcastic terms as well, for the remainder of his life was mustered out of the service. Of uh, the 2,163 men who had served in the ranks of the 1st Wisconsin, they had 83 men who died. Most indications are that of those 83, 79 of them died from disease. Only four in any type of combat activity, which would have been um, skirmishes more so than any major military engagement. He returned to Wisconsin, and waiting for him was his wife, and Noe Bates, and a daughter who he had uh, not really gotten to know before he actually joined the military. But his daughter, Hattie, had been born in January of 1865. A period newspaper says Bates returned at the close of hostilities to his home, and after some reverses in business deprived him of nearly all of his money, he managed to purchase five acres of good, deep, rich soil and went into the grape business. So he's evidently wanting to grow grapes and hopefully produce some wine uh, in the Wisconsin area. In the mid-1860s, he was a Democrat, and that's going to serve as the genesis of the act, which is going to lead him to his prominence, and again, where he's going to receive accolades and hatred as well. In his autobiography, he said, I was a resident of the state of Wisconsin. I had been a soldier in the Federal Army during the war to suppress the rebellion. I was a northern man in every sentiment. But move forward to November of 1867, and there was a highly debated, hotly contested governor's race in the state of Wisconsin. Bates actually <coughs> went into a, his local town to buy a pipe, and while he was waiting to purchase a pipe, he heard some of the gentlemen in this particular establishment solving the world's problems. We have a local cafe in our little town, a population of about 600, and the men gather around, they call them the genius table, and the men and women work out all the problems. Uh, in Middleton, Tennessee, if y'all need anything that you need to talk about, let them know. But he heard, overheard a group of people talking about the cruel Southerners. Now, I think you're going to see before long, he's going to experience Southern hospitality firsthand. But he walked up to him and he said, Southerners are not cruel. And one of the guys, by his own account, said, Sergeant, the Southerners are rebels yet. They're worse now than they were during the war. They hate the Union flag. No man dare show that flag anywhere in the South except in the presence of our soldiers. He told them that wasn't right. He said, I believe I could take that U.S. flag down South today, march across any state, uh, and nobody would hurt me. That is the nucleus of the bet that will propel him again to fame and uh, hatred. He enters a bet with a man that he can march across the South carrying the U.S. flag. No one is with him unless it's somebody carrying his luggage. He also says, I will be unarmed, but I can march across the South. I will be fed, I will be housed, and I will be safe. I can carry that flag across the South to any location that you bet that I can, and I will be treated with the highest level of hospitality. So what he will do, he'll go down the Mississippi River, spends a night in Memphis, ends up reaching Vicksburg, and Vicksburg will be the starting point of his march. He is going to march across the South, the Deep South, uh, less than three years after the end of the American Civil War, flies the flag above is every capital, <laughs> above every capital, <laughs> this is him, not a, not a big man, uh, Bates was approximately five feet, four inches tall, so a little bit shorter than I am, and there are indications that this man is him. Now, again, I cannot verify. We obviously know that that's him. There are going to be a couple of other photographs, but this is the uh, first Wisconsin Heavy Artillery, and that may be him. If you will, sir, if you'll click again, I'll show a couple more pictures here, uh, kind of for an introduction. These are two photographs, one you can tell, uh, published June of 68, and this is his signature as well. That's him with the flag that he carried across the South. You would think that um, this particular relic would be well preserved, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't know where it is. But we, we'll talk some about that as well in a few minutes. 
Uh, in Vicksburg, Bates was not only received warmly, but he was given a room in what was considered to be the nicest hotel in town. He was fed and he was given a new set of clothing. Now again, how's that for Southern hospitality? And you can tell the uniform that he wore as he marched across the South. He was not trying to disguise himself in any means. Part of the bet was that he would walk in broad daylight. He could not conceal himself at night. And he said that when he was in Vicksburg, he wrote these words down. He said, when Sherman made his march across the South, he carried the sword in one hand and the torch in the other. The flag of the Union was then an emblem of death and ruin to the Southern people. But I was determined to pass over much of his line of march, to tread the battlefields which were treaded by his army, to pass through the cities that were burned by his men. But in my hand, the war being ended, the same flag was to be the emblem of peace and friendship and goodwill to the South. Bates reached Jackson, Mississippi, where he was again an honored guest. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Mississippi's history during the American Civil War, Jackson, Mississippi was referred to as Chimney Town because when Joseph Johnston arrived, he sent a telegram back to Richmond, I'm too late. Most of Jackson, Mississippi's homes had been burned and only those old chimneys like we see from burned out houses remain. Uh, he reached Montgomery, Alabama, February of 1868. Well, let's stop and think about this. He's making this march across the South the winter of 1868. He is to reach uh, Washington, D.C. by July the 4th, which he will reach far ahead of schedule, right, Mr. John? Yeah. But he said again in Montgomery, I was met with another magnificent reception. The ladies of the city made me a beautiful pink sash, which again, you can see in this photograph. Uh, a fine silk ornamented with heavy gold. It was presented to me at a public public festival, excuse me, given to aid some charitable purpose. It is really a beautiful sash. Printed the day after Bates arrived in Montgomery, there was an article in the Alexandria Gazette that said, Sergeant Bates was met by a large number of citizens in carriages decorated with U.S. flags. Montgomery, Alabama, first, first capital of the Confederate States of America. About 3,000 people turned out to hear the speeches and welcome him. All right, guys, I'll try to click again. We'll see what we got here. That's going to work. Okay, I'm so yeah, sorry. I, I won't get it. Uh, that's, that is fine. There was uh, a man by the name of Aldolfa Shaver who was an attorney by, by the time that uh, Bates met with him. He had served in the 16th Alabama Infantry. And he said to Bates, You've undertaken to demonstrate to the country the fact that the South, when she laid her arms down at Appomattox and other points, did so in good faith, and that her people are anxious, if possible, to observe the terms of that surrender, and that the charges of rebellious hostility on their part toward the government are groundless. Again, person after person reaffirms Bates' stance. He reaches Georgia February 25th, and as he experienced in both Mississippi and Alabama, he is received warmly. He said at Columbus, Another fine reception awaited, and during my sojourn, I was a constant recipient of attentions. Many of the war-ravaged cities that Bates reaches, he will actually be given tours of what his brothers in arms had done three years or so earlier. Uh, gifts were given to him, people handed him money, and again, he could keep those. The bet was for a dollar a day, which when he finishes, he'll end up giving that to charity. But the gifts that he would teach, and this is somewhat reminiscent of Richard Nixon with his checkers speech that he had, when people would give dolls to him to give to his daughter, he would send those back to her. Uh, he reported the date of his entry into South Carolina as March 16th of 68. Again, he said, I was heartily received in Hamburg. He just kind of gives that as a little uh, side note. He said, so many of the receptions were large that I got uh, grew somewhat tired of them. The people just overfeeding him. And he also was well fed uh, and evidently liked to drink a lot because he mentions that in, in some of his journals as well. He talks again about reaching Columbia, South Carolina. He said the march had been severe. The weather was rainy. The roads bad. The, sw the, the streams were swollen enormously. And I had no bridges to cross over. Again, he's seeing where the bridges have been burned out by his brothers in arms. I was compelled to ford the streams on foot and, of course, was frequently wet with cold water. And that's one of the major uh, effects that he has upon his health for the remainder of his life. Uh, he, he will be um, 
subjected to marching oftentimes in wet socks, wet boots, and he'll get sores on his feet. So oftentimes he'd have to stay in these towns two or three days longer than what he had originally planned. This again is another photograph of him. Uh, you can tell this, of course, is year 1872. And this is from Harper's Weekly, uh, him reaching the city of Richmond. Again, you can see the throngs of people. Uh, the only attack that he received was from a pack of dogs. And he had to beat them away with his flagstaff. But again, nobody is going to try to kill him. There will be some plots that will be uncovered. Uh, involving some payoffs toward freedmen who were offered large sums of money to attack him, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. As was done in Mississippi, and Alabama, and Georgia, he reaches the state capital in South Carolina, and he's urged to fly the flag over the, the capital of South Carolina. U.S. flag hoisted over the flag of South Carolina three and a half years roughly uh, after they had a large amounts of devastation there. He would do the same in North Carolina despite the situation. He says, at Greensboro, I was offered $10,000, far more than a dollar a day, which I was to receive, provided I would stop the march and go home. I was to do so apparently in disgust. I did a little um, ciphering, if you will, using a couple of internet sites. $10,000 in 1868 equals approximately $1,900,000 today. So, I mean, he would have been super wealthy if he just said, you know, this, this was wrong. What a travesty. I shouldn't have done this. But again, he was earning a dollar a day on his march. The only complications, again, that he talks about is that plot, uh, somebody giving $10,000, attacked by dogs. And then he said there were two robberies of his hotel rooms. He would leave his money behind. People would break in, steal his money. He arrived in Danville, Virginia on April the 4th, 1868. There again, he said, another large group of people, I'm not going to describe it anymore minutely. So he was tired of it by then. In Richmond, as we have here, he arrives fatigued and hungry. He would spend a short time in his exchange hotel room, unable, though, to fellowship with others because he said, I need to rest and take my dinner. Then after he ate, he took his flag and rode around the principal parts of town. Again, I think you can tell based upon this Harper's Weekly print that he was well received. Note again, that took place in Richmond. And at this point, he says, I lighted the eastern entrance to the Capitol grounds and I marched through those, ascended to the dome and waved my flag over the city that was once the stronghold of the rebellion. Untold thousands of people had gathered in the grounds and in the building. Again, remember, the former Confederate capital. The people, again, seemed to really admire Bates and certainly exhibited Southern hospitality toward him. In the coming days, he reached Washington, D.C. In fact, he did so April the 14th, 1868, which I think most of us who are students of the American Civil War know that April 14th certainly holds some significance. Mm -hmm. He said, by 9 o'clock in the morning, I had assembled, uh, people had assembled at the Long Bridge, a numerous concourse of citizens. When it was announced that I was there, the crowd was quite large. Many ladies, of whom I found admirable fan, uh, fanatics of mine, and distinguished personages, personages were among the number. But here is the tragedy of the Bates March. And this again, I think you can see why our country has been slow to reunite. He reaches Washington, D.C. with the goal to fly the flag over the Capitol. The Sergeant of Arms for both the Senate and the House of Representatives refuses to allow him to do so. He is invited in to a joint session of Congress and he is introduced and is asked to speak, but he was a somewhat shy man and refused to do so, but he was not allowed to fly that flag because it had flown over the former seceded states. Mm -hmm. He did fly his flag in Washington, D.C. It was over the then unfinished Washington <coughs> Monument, which those of you have been to Washington, D.C., you can see the, the two colors uh, from the Aqua Creek sandstone where it, uh, it was delayed, but he said, that that was how he was received in Washington, D.C. Uh, we will hear a little bit more about Bates as the year goes on. Sir, if you will click again, I apologize. Uh, here you see Gilbert Henderson Bates in a later vocation. People criticize him in Northern papers that he never would get a quote unquote real job <laughs> and that he should have been a brick mason as one of his brother was, but instead he wanted to live off the generosity of people and he was a bum. In fact, we will talk more about that uh, before we conclude tonight. The picture on the top left, you'll notice, is the Wild West Show on its voyage from New York to London. 
he worked for Buffalo Bill, and when Buffalo Bill made his trip to England, uh, he was part of that massive troop when Buffalo Bill entertained thousands of people for several months in England. And I think you can tell again, somewhat uh, high point of notoriety, and y'all excuse my short height here, that is Gilbert Henderson Bates right there. He is holding the flag in the middle upper tier of the group. I think obviously he's well respected. And again, it's a man who most of us are not familiar with uh, before tonight's presentation. If you'll click one more time for me, sir, and I apologize. There are some rumors that he had made, have been uh, a big time fan, if you will, and I'm gonna keep this on gentlemanly terms, of uh, Annie Oakley. And he, and he and Annie Oakley may have actually carried on a relationship uh, ungrounded uh, rumors as such on that. Right. And um, we will come back and show you a photo on that in a few minutes. But not a lot is known or talked about Bates from the time he retires, if you will, from the Buffalo Bill Wild West Show until we see. Oh, here we go. Here is Gilbert Henderson Bates uh, with one of the young ladies, American ladies, who was part of the group. And again, you can tell, like myself, he is not blessed with height or hair in these photographs. But here you see him with some of the Native Americans who were also uh, members of the Sioux Nation as well as Pawnee, and they're part of the group when Buffalo Bill is uh, traversing England. Guys, so we'll click one more time while we got her going, and I'll, I'll show you this one. Uh, this is a flyer or pamphlet that was used to advertise the Buffalo Bill show after it had made its original appearance in England. If you notice, for example, top left-hand corner, you have Buffalo Bill. Notice who's Buffalo Bill's immediate right. You've got Gilbert Henderson Bates presenting his flag to the Queen of England. And of course, here again, you see various personages from that show. But to me, again, I think we can tell Buffalo Bill felt highly about him. He will become addicted to a painkiller. There will be rumors of his suicide. Uh, some of the newspapers up north said, why did it not happen sooner? Uh, but those rumors were only rumors. Sadly, the next information that we really have about Gilbert Henderson Bates, though, uh, comes from him in 1917. And it says, he carried our flag to many lands. Gilbert Henderson Bates, better known as Sergeant Bates, died on Saturday afternoon at his home. But again, this man is going to serve our country. He is going to try to reunite it. Uh, that addiction to the painkiller, you're going to have people ridiculing him in northern papers. I could not find a southern paper that slammed him other than when he talked about carrying the United States flag across the northern states. One of them said something to the effect of, let's see how he is received up there. But I want to read this to you, and again, it's not profane, but I will apologize for somewhat aggressive uh, language. Most of the newspapers are going to hail him as a hero but there were some that thought quite poorly of him. One northern paper, paper said he was a crack brain fellow anxious for some cheap notoriety. Another, the Springfield Republican, by the way, Abraham Lincoln's hometown and home paper, said Sergeant Bates was, and again, excuse my friends, the champion, the champion jackass of the world. He was ridiculed for his apparent poor work ethic, uh, which critics say that he needed to go again and get a, a real job. But he will criticize America's entry into the Spanish-American War. He was extremely anti-imperialistic. That uh, caused a lot of animosity toward a lot of Americans as well. But again, he will pass away in 1917 and will be interred in uh, the city of Saybrook, Illinois at the age of 81. Now, I know we have oftentimes seen this. Couples married for years and years, and one spouse passes away and the other one dies within a short period of time. Keep in mind, I told you that he passed away in February of 1917, February 17th, more specifically. March 22nd, his 71-year-old wife, Anna, who had been married to him by approximately, approximately 45 years at that time, passed away as well. Three of their children lived well into the 1900s. One had died tragically as a youngster. But my manuscript attempts to cover more details of his trek than what we have talked about tonight. We get into like what he ate at some of the places. He was really descriptive of that as well. He will talk about the sores upon his feet. There again are some shortcomings, and I'll be the first to say this. 
and those are with his early life as well as any of his military exploits. He doesn't really get into that and it's not really much documentation on that. But those I feel like are somewhat countered by uh, his dealings with Buffalo Bill. Uh, he does talk about some unrealized marches because he will march across uh, not only the South, he marches across England. Yep. There he is treated really well. And again, that's, that's a whole other story in itself, but he was challenged should you march across the North. But I think again, this man marches 1,400 miles across what was enemy territory less than five years earlier. I don't know myself, I wouldn't have the courage to do that. He faced the challenge, he conquered it, and earned a massive amount of not only acclaimers, but antagonists as well along the way. He financially struggled his entire life. And again, I don't know, uh, Mr. John, uh, he and I have talked about this before, if he was really as lazy or lacked that great work ethic as a lot of people said, but he died in, as he spent his final years in relative obscurity. Sadly though, he's been largely forgotten in our nation's history. And I think if <coughs> nothing else, that mission that he had of reconciliation is one reason why we certainly need to keep him in mind. Yeah. Uh, I will point out very quickly what my other ones are about, and then I will be glad to entertain any questions that y'all have. I probably can't answer what Mr. John can. I have a book entitled African American Civil War Medals of Honor. Those are all the men who earned medals of honor during the American Civil War. Again, uh, most of them, of course, are gonna be like the new market, but you'll have some relatively obscure ones as well. Uh, just above that, I have Tennessee's Civil War Generals, which is basically the same thing as the generals from Mississippi. These are all of the men who reached the rank of uh, general from Mississippi or Tennessee during the course of the American Civil War. Some who rose the rank, such as Nathan Bedford Forrest, some who were political appointees, such as Felix Zollicoffer, who would be killed at Mill Springs in somewhat tragic situations as well. Speaking of Mill Springs, I have a book entitled Kentucky Civil War Battlefields. Again, if y'all ever get desperate for a speaker and want me to do any on, uh, presentation on any of these, I can gladly do them. I covered the major battles in the state of Kentucky and talk about their level of preservation or lack thereof. Same idea with Tennessee, uh, same idea with Mississippi. And again, we visit those battlefields, we walk across them, Sharon bless her heart, she has been <laughs> everywhere that I've been, but I, I tell people that uh, she stuck with me for 34 years for some reason. I, I don't know why. I'll be hey, quite Randy, honest. But uh, uh, yes, I've got that Kentucky book. It's real good. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I Kentucky appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, my, one of my best sellers is a Civil War devotional. And I mentioned Sharon because this was her idea. She said, Your two favorite things to talk about are the American Civil War and the Bible. And she came up with the idea, and I dedicated it to her. I credit it to her. Uh, she is my hero in many ways. About 10 years ago, I nearly lost her to cancer. But she's back and as mean as ever now, so I'm glad she's still here with us. But I took an event from each day of the year and related to either a verse or a scripture. If there was not a battle or a skirmish, it might be a topic such as homesickness, or it could be, you know, uh, people writing home and telling about the death of a friend. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll close with that in a few minutes. Uh, there were three bro brothers from Hardin County, Tennessee. Now, Hardin County is Savannah. Savannah is the city that was home to the Cherry Mansion where Grant was when he heard the cannons firing on the morning of April 6, 1862 at Shiloh. These brothers all joined different units during the American Civil War. They were all killed during the war and buried in unmarked graves. One was killed at First Manassas or First Bull Run, uh, the other at Murfreesboro, and one uh, just outside of Atlanta. Again, all buried in unmarked graves. There was a family in Somerville, Tennessee, who said, we have some letters that an ancestor wrote during the war. Would you want to write about those? And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so that's what the bulk of the manuscript is that. Uh, just want to kind of mention that to you. Not related to the American Civil War at all, but one day in class, we were talking about the Trail of Tears. And one of my students said, uh, did any of the soldiers and the Native American girls ever fall in love? And I said, well, I don't know. I've never really thought about that. She said, you need to take that and run with it. Sharon's maiden name was Belle. So I followed the bell route uh, on the Trail of Tears, and that's basically the story behind that. The first book that I wrote 
dealing with Archer's Tennessee Brigade, 1st, 7th, and 14th Tennessee. These guys are going to uh, be members of the Army of Northern Virginia. They will fight in every major battle uh, that the uh, Army of Northern Virginia fought in, surrendered a fragment of its original ranks at Appomattox. Um, again, I've talked about the Mississippi one, and then tonight's presentation came from the Marching for Union. I thought March for Union would be a great title, but the publisher said, who want Marching for Union? So that's why it's nice Marching for Union. So again, I know you know that you don't have a lot of control over what is done once it comes to that point. I will be glad, yes sir, yes sir. I, I want to know the circumstances of finding this picture because having researched a lot, I, did you start with this picture? No, sir. I started but, with John's but, idea. But you one day tell tell us about that. Okay. Most of the photographs that I have are either public domain uh, through the Library of Congress or the ones that you have to pay big time for, which this is one of them, is through the Buffalo Bill Museum in Cody, Wyoming. Yeah. They, they had that one. They have an online uh, library, if you will, where you can research, but to use those, they... Uh, they are, Charging, they, they are they are proud of them, yes sir. Uh, when Dave Roth, who published Blue and Gray magazine, made maps for me, Dave Roth would charge me a hundred dollars a map uh, that didn't come close to using those pictures there. It's uh, they, they're, they're proud of them. That's you must it. have been excited to see that. I, I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I, I think that shows again if that's the promotional uh, flyer for it. I mean, I think again that shows what William Cody thought of him. And one of my favorite pictures of William Cody. Uh, was made in Tupelo, Mississippi. I, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen it before, but when he was he was there during during the war, um, we got to go to Tupelo at some point in the next few days and buy school supplies. So. But yeah. We had a guy from Florence that was in, just across the river that was in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in the early 1900s. Are you for real? A guy named Arthur C. Carter. I did not marry a girl from Killing. He had earlier been in the Spanish American War with Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. Then he was in the uh, Buffalo Bills Wild West Show and then the Panama Canal Police Force. And is it not sad about Buffalo Bill basically, you know, loses yeah. everything he had to, oh, yeah. again, imagine the expense of feeding and housing and clothes. He, he, he was in the seventh Kansas, right? <coughs> well, that's right, yes. I know it was Kansas, right? I think so. Yeah, but, so they, they were here with Cornyn, but I believe he didn't join up with them until after 18, I think he was with them early, but he was in Kansas at the time they came from Cornyn. Because Tupelo yeah. would have been what, uh, late 64? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Some of yeah. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, it's kind of like, like we're talking about Bates. I mean, he was in there, but not, not here in what we might call the heart of the fighting. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be glad.